Uh, Roger, thank you very much for that lovely introduction, and thank you for having me here. I was actually feeling quite confident about my talk yesterday morning. Uh, several reasons why I'm now feeling less confident. The first is, last night was fantastic. There were terrific talks and uh, wonderful drama, and I realized I really ought to be able to raise my game. The second thing is, I'm singing for my supper, but what a supper we've had so far. I mean, it's been effectively the beginning of a sort of Gesamtkunstwerk, all the arts coming together. So I really want to thank uh, Jacob and Alan and Roger and Pasquale and many others who've been very much involved in putting together this event, which is unique in my experience. There is a third and smaller reason why I'm more anxious about this talk than I was yesterday, and it's evident on the slides. Those slides look as if a two-year-old has been throwing its breakfast at them. In fact, what happened was it got lost in translation. When I put my stick into the uh, computer, uh, the computer rebelled, and that is the result. So I hope the slides, they're not as pretty as they would have been, but I hope very much uh, that they make some kind, some kind of sense. So uh, this morning I'm going to offer you a theory, a thesis, a hypothesis about the nature and purpose of the arts. And even if it's mistaken, and I'm sure many of you feel it may be mistaken or at least inadequate, I hope it'll be interestingly mistaken because I'm going to make the bold suggestion that the significance of the arts is to be found deep in our human nature. Thinking about the arts and why they mean so much to us sometimes requires us to acknowledge what I've called the wound in the present tense of human consciousness. Now, before I focus on art, I want to make one or two brief comments about the present, the present tense. Because of all the tenses of human consciousness, it is the most complex, difficult, and mis mysterious. By comparison, the past and future are relatively straightforward. At the heart of the present is a paradox, as indicated in the title of my talk. It is at once inescapable and elusive. It's inescapable because whatever exists is in some sense present. It's always now. But the present is also elusive, and it's this elusiveness that I want to concentrate on in my talk, although, as will become apparent, the notion of the present as a moment or as a short stretch of time shows how its elusiveness is connected with its inescapability. And that's all the philosophy of time that I'm going to bother you with. So my thesis is that a work of art invites a perfected and connected attention, enabling us more fully to experience our experiences and thus to satisfy a profound human hunger to be more entirely there, to achieve what we might call existential plenitude. It is a response to that sense of ephemerality that is the theme of our meeting. Now, I'm acutely aware that any theory of art has to deal with perhaps even ignore certain awkward truths. For example, the very notion of art is baggy, with much contested territory around the edges. That's why it's possible in certain circles to make a reputation as an artist simply by presenting as art something that isn't, or to use an old-fashioned term, something that's no good. And there is, of course, more than one kind of art, and you're entitled to be skeptical about a theory that tries to encompass statues, novels and symphonies, ceramics, poems and string quartets. Any such theory also must be cast in very general terms and it most certainly won't help us to evaluate individual works of art to tell us what's good and what isn't. What's more, it's possible to discover many different purposes to art, both in the history of mankind and indeed in the history of our own lives. In, li in our lives, art may not infrequently be just another kind of fun, a distraction, another way of passing the time. But I want to focus on the present era and on the distinctive nature and significance of the satisfaction that art might afford us when it is at, at its best and we are at our most receptive. And here's another point that anyone who talks about art has to engage, namely that they're always entering a conversation that's been going on for a rather long time. Consequently, when someone offers a thesis, you can be sure they have some opposing view in mind. So I might as well highlight some of these alternative views, if only to set them aside for the present. These include the views that art serves religious, ethical, political, and economic functions. 
Now, of course, art historically has had an important role in mediating between man and God, between the quotidian and the eternal. Church music, sacred poetry, painted visions of God, his angels, the saints and the afterlife have all had a crucial role. Long after art became detached from its key function in ritual. And my thesis is that of an atheist humanist and examines a secular society where Bach's The Glory of God has been displaced by the benefit of my neighbor. Incidentally, I think we need to consider not only the nature of art, but also the nature of the spiritual in a secular age. It's part of a task, hardly started, of getting a clear view of what we are. We acknowledge that we are part from nature, but we're also part of it. Well, how, what sense can we make of that? It's my view that humanist thought, like humanity, is a work in progress, but that is a topic for another day. Now, the most tenacious idea about the benefits that art may bring to the artist's neighbor is that it is in some specifiable sense useful, promoting social solidarity, helping us to get on better with each other, making us worthier citizens. There is the belief that art may make us behave better at the individual level through the promotion of empathy, the education of the imagination, or indeed at the collective level. Unfortunately, the evidence for art making us individually or collectively more virtuous is slender. The most ardent readers of literature, listeners to classical music, and visitors to galleries do not seem to behave better, strikingly better, than the uncultured. Professional musicians, literary critics, and gallery curators steeped in their respective arts are rarely Latter-day Saints. And history has afforded us plenty of examples of the coexistence of high culture and sickening and systematic barbarity. As for the political role of art, the rule seems to be that the better the art, the more nuanced, and consequently the more remote it is from an easy take on the issues of the day, the less effective it is as propaganda. Effective propaganda, which knows in advance what has to be said and how it should be said, is usually mediocre art. And by the way, the instrumentalizing idea that art should be valued on account of its contribution to the gross domestic product, an idea captured in the horrible phrase, the creative industries, should be set aside. One word, poetry, is sufficient to dispose of it. Keats' greatness is not to be measured by his contribution to the Regency economy. So we have to dig a little deeper in order to see the purpose of art today. And we may find a clue in Nietzsche's rather gnomic assertion that the creation of art is the only metaphysical activity to which life still obliges us. And so I come to my thesis. The need that art meets arises out of the very nature of human consciousness, more particularly out of the wound in its present tense. Now the heart of the thesis is the observation we don't fully experience our experiences. As a consequence, we may be haunted by the sense that our lives are somehow eluding us. This is of no importance when we are hungry, thirsty, or in pain, or frightened, or suffering the many woes that humans inflict on each other. It is not even of great importance when we go about our daily business of ensuring, however indirectly, our survival, or making a living, discharging our duties towards others. No, art finds its place not in the kingdom of means, but in the kingdom of ends, where we seek life more abundant. The need that art addresses has its root in our curious condition, our condition of being creatures who have partly woken out of the state of being an animal. Half awakened, we're constantly engaged in making explicit sense of the world and of our fellow humans. And this sense remains tantalizingly incomplete and stubbornly local. We may consequently be haunted by the feeling that we've not fully realized our own existence, not fully realized that we exist, not fully realized the scale and scope of what we are and of the world we live in. It's a kind of existential hollowness. Now, such hollowness may present itself in different ways, but it's most evident when we seek out experience for its own sake. Then we experience perhaps a mismatch between the actual experience we have and the idea we had of that same experience that led us to seek it out. In addition to this feeling of not experiencing our experiences, those experiences seem insufficiently connected. As we move from one thing to another, often in increasing haste, 
as if a rising curve of consumption could bring us closer to true satisfaction, they don't somehow add up. Now we may characterize this lack of connectedness in different ways, that we're always small sampling our lives and our worlds, occupying only a minute part of the total of ourselves. Or that we are somehow condemned to live in the dominion of and, or the kingdom of and then, and then, and then, in which we pass on from one thing to another without ever quite arriving, without ever being fully at anything. At any rate, we're in the danger of seeming to pass through our days, even in good health, never having been fully there, or never having fully grasped our being there, because we can't close the gap between what we are and what we know, between our ideas and our experiences, our experiences and the life and world of which they are a part. Nor finally, do we realize that freedom of which we as humans are at least, under favorable circumstances, uniquely capable. Now that's a lot of territory and a lot to take on trust. So I'm going to come down to one or two aspects of the thesis. How does art address this wound in the present tense? In part, I would say, it does so through reconciling the sensory and imaginative dimensions of consciousness, the particular experience of what is there with the general idea or ideal of what might be there, our abstract notions with concrete instances. One approach to understanding how art unites these adversaries is through the general concept of artistic form, a complex and much contested notion which we could spend the rest of our meeting discussing without reaching a satisfactory conclusion. But let me throw out a few strikingly unoriginal Aesthetics 101 hints. In the case of works of art, which are composite and multiple, form refers less to the outline than to the inner shape or arrangement of parts. The arrangement is an orderly, or sometimes calculatedly disorderly one. Form in art is largely about, even in rebellion against, due shape, proper figure. The form conforms to, or more recently refers to, plays with, undermines, a model, type, or conventional pattern. This doesn't say very much about how artistic form differs from forms encountered outside of art, nor within art about the difference between the great and the mediocre, but it'll have to do for the moment. We may think of form in art as that by virtue of which things otherwise experienced or considered separately are brought together as one. That unity and variety which conveys a sense of sameness in difference. And we might look beneath this to a sense of stillness underneath change and to the Aristotelian idea of form as the moving unmoved. The common function or effect of formal features that unify across variety is to integrate experiences that would otherwise be separate would otherwise be a mere sequence, mere and. Sometimes incongruous and disparate things may be brought together, outrageous couplings, dissonant discourses, disjunct objects. Perhaps most importantly, the nears and fars of the world, booty from the four corners of the empire of experience, are brought together. So this permits a different kind of experience, arising out of a work that expands into and fills the lineaments of something larger than moment-to-moment -moment consciousness. Something, in short, answering to the ideas we hope to experience when we seek experience for its own sake. A work of art is a concretely realized idea, an idea as large as those that haunt our consciousness in anticipation and memory, larger than those that are realized in ordinary experience. The formal structure integrates over time in music, over space in the visual arts, though we seem to unpack space from music and we experience paintings and sculptures in time. And it integrates over a multidimensional hyperspace in referential, non-iconic forms, such as literature. But how does this palliate the sense that our experiences are eaten away from within by, for example, the ideas of experience? It's perhaps easiest to understand this in the most obviously formal of all the arts, music, and only weekly or secondarily referential medium whose ordering of parts is not significantly determined by an external or extra musical reality. Form and subject matter are one. 
As Roger Scruton, a name that might be familiar to some of you, has described it, sounds can be identified without referring to any object which participates them, in them. And it's precisely this feature that is seized upon by music and made into the template on which the art of music is built. And it's this, in part, which justifies Walter Pater's famous assertion that all art constantly aspires to the condition of music. Think of the relationship between idea or form and acoustic sensation in the experience of a melody. Each note is fully present as an actual physical event. And yet, because the music conforms to a form that shapes expectation and assists recall, through conformity to the rules of harmony, of contrast and symmetry, of progression and repetition, that individual note is manifestly and explicitly part of a larger whole. There's no conflict, therefore, between the form or the idea of the music and its actual instance. Our moments of listening are imbued with a sense of what is to come and what has passed. The form to which the music conforms that ties what has gone and what is to come with each other and with what is present shines through these individual moments. Of course, the music has its journeys. It manifestly is a journey from a beginning to an end, and in great music we feel as if we travel great distances to and indeed through a remote paysage of sound. But the journeying is never merely a piece of one route. The unfolding of the form fills and fulfills the sensation of the present moment with the past and the future, rather than undermining it with the past and the future. A light motif recurring throughout music like an involuntary memory ties together the beginning, the middle and the end, making it all one. The retrospective light it casts on all that has gone before creates the feeling that we've been arriving all the time and indeed that we are arrived. So the ephemeral is arrested. The perfected journeying that is music is continuous arrival, which is why, although it is so clearly set out in time, it is a liberation from time. It has the forward movement of time, but in it, the way and towards of time are united. And that's why also there are moments when listening to music, we have the sense of enjoying our own consciousness in italics, like a hurrying river dilating into a lagoon, our becoming has momentarily dilated into being. And so we're invited to a perfect, undistracted attention. But it is connected, the sense of one damn thing after another is palliated. We are liberated momentarily, or for a while, from the dominion of and. Meaning is replete. Indeed, meaning loses its ing. But let me illustrate this with a different art, literature, where a complex tale brings together a beginning, a middle, and an end. At its height, literary art can give us the sense of recovering an entire world, as Ian Forster describes so brilliantly in his essay on War and Peace. After one has read War and Peace, he says, for a while, great chords begin to sound. We cannot say exactly what struck them. They come from the immense area of Russia, over which episodes and characters have been scattered, from the sum total of bridges and frozen rivers, forests, roads, gardens, fields, which accumulate grandeur and sonority after we have passed them. And Forster goes on to say that it is extended over space as well as time. And the sense of space until it terrifies us is exhilarating and leaves behind it an effect like music. The space is, of course, a virtual space of signs, of words. So there is an escape from the moment into a world which also conquers elusiveness by gathering it up together. And this access to an entire world is present also in the visual arts. Consider this Rembrandt self-portrait. You see the man's life in the painted surface. As Shakespeare anticipated it, thus is his cheek the map of days outworn. The and then and then of those days is gathered up. And the example also illustrates how the experience of art, as experience and emotion and memory cultivated for its own sake, not only lifts us up from the often self-emptying pell-mell, but enables us to realize to the full the potential freedom that our partial liberation by a human condition from our biological destiny can afford us. The spectatorial freedom that we are permitted by our temporal past, extended from the present into a future, our being freed from the constraints of the pre present moment, is taken to a further level when we look, for example, 
at the images of objects, removed from the places where we might be obliged to act in response to them. Consider what happens when a face is translated from the presence of a person to a portrait on a wall, or a landscape is lifted from the land to a gallery. This freedom is also exploited in our virtual participation in the lives, worlds, and dilemmas of imaginary or real fellow creatures through narratives that engage our memory, knowledge, understanding, empathy, and emotions. And in music, it is there in the virtual causality, to use Roger's brilliant phrase, that links one note, one chord, with another in the unfolding melody, a necessity that is an elective rather than an endured necessity, an aesthetic necessity. Because sounds are pure events, we can detach them in thought and experience from their causes and impose upon them an order quite independent of any physical order in the world. This happens, Roger says, in the acousmatic experience of sound, when people focus on the sounds themselves and on what can be heard in them. What they then hear is not a succession of sounds, and this is the key point, but a movement between tones governed by a virtual causality that resides in the musical line. For the present, I leave you the thought that the purpose, or if that sounds a bit too instrumental, the significance of art is not to be found in any practical use it may have, but in its addressing the wound in our consciousness, in helping us to recover a wholeness from a world delivered in fragments as one damn thing follows another, and permitting us a glimpse of a fuller or more full realization of our human freedom. It is, of course, itself ephemeral. The escape is only temporal, temporary, but it is an important image of how we may become more completely ourselves. We are not, of course, saved by art. It enables us to become from time to time what we potentially are, or it gives us an image of what we might be. And who knows, the temporary healing of the wound in the present tense may help to curb the drive to ever-increasing consumption. But once you start talking about saving the planet, you know it's time to stop. So thank you for your attention, or at least for the courtesy of simulating it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was terrific. Thank you, Ray. Um, thank you. I, I, I wonder, elsewhere you have talked about this this matter of uh, the way in which art gives completion to what is otherwise uh, fragmentary uh, uh, deliverances of the present, the present consciousness. Someone might say, um, why should we want completion? Uh, isn't the, you know, uh, the, whole, the whole glory of living in time that you can as it were, move on to the next moment and get rid of that last one. Mm. Uh, you know, that perhaps, perhaps some people find a, a, a kind of fulfillment in not being fulfilled in the moment, you know. Yeah. Uh, I just wonder, although I, I agree with you entirely, because like you, I, 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 for me, art is the, is the salvation, and it's a salvation because it points to this here now, yeah. but nevertheless, it's very difficult to persuade the ordinary person in the street, you know, that this, this um, is what is lacking for, in his experience. Yeah. I mean, I think your question's a good one. It, first of all, it seems to me that any talk about what art means is essentially autobiographical in a sort of way. So it's probably what it means to me. But it's not even straightly autobiographical. It's an interpretation of what one thinks is going on in one's own biography. So those are two areas of vulnerability. But the thing that has struck me about my own experiences and other, talking to other people is that there is this tension between an experience that is sought out and the idea of that experience. And the experience when you have it outside of art or outside the perfection of art is always, it, can never, it never stops and happens fully. And it's uh, affected by all sorts of contingent events. Uh, and I guess by gathering in those contingent things, either, or either by excluding them or gathering them in, the work of art can, as it were, deal with that central unsatisfactoriness of experience. And I would want to reiterate that, of course, for most people, this isn't even an issue. When you're hungry or thirsty or suffering from 
some disease as my patients did over the years, these things really don't matter at all. Your life has a terrible plenitude. You know, when you're hungry, your life is full of hunger. You know, you're absolutely at that spot. So it's very much um, a story about the sort of experiences one seeks when one is freed from all the pressures of, of life. But I would come back to my original point. To some extent, it is autobiographical, and clearly it's something, Roger, you and I share as a view of art. Um, but it may not be one that's shared by others. And I certainly wouldn't exclude great art from sometimes, hopefully, talking about outrages, iniquities, and so on and so forth. I mean, Dickens was a great artist, there's no doubt about it. And uh, he certainly had huge influence on um, the way we thought about, how, how the way we treated each other, particular Victorian capitalism. So, um, so there's a very unsatisfactory answer to your excellent question, Roger. Some small contribution, which uh, has to do with my own experience, um, thinking about Cezanne. Uh, the whole work of Cezanne, you know, he, when he started, he was probably the most untalented, untalented guy you can imagine. Mm -hmm. His father told him, don't become an artist, you cannot make, you cannot draw. And then you see him at the end, the last paintings, the Le Carriere de Bibemus, uh, Les Dessins, La Peinture de, de Son Jardinier, and so it has so much to do with what Luc Lucrez said, uh, the world is, consists of single atoms, atoms. And I don't know who, who described this for me, that the last paintings of Cezanne, he wanted to reconstruct the world with a small pencil mm. uh, showing us the atoms, so he wanted to build his own world. And at the end, this probably not very talented uh, drawing man, Cezanne, he could, he could reconstruct his own world. And what you said about uh, Tolstoy, I mean, his imagination for uh, around this hundred of figures in, of, of the Napoleon Wars, he came up with three, four mythological yeah. person. So it's, it's to order the world. The world is chaos. But I can order it by, by showing it through the work of arts. And for me, the, the, the last 10 years of Cezanne, he really ordered for me the world in the way uh, Lucrez, I pronounce him the German way, Lucrez found the world existing through atoms, which yeah. is more or less, he was right. I think, I mean, your comment usefully points to something that was missing in my talk, which was, we th I've talked about art in terms of the recipient, but there is the drama of being an artist, of being somebody discovering new ways of expressing things, which I think is a different kind of artistic engagement in the world, but I think that is extraordinarily important. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad you chose the particular Cezanne painting of the, the gardener. It's one of my absolute favorites. And also I'm very glad you referred to Tolstoy because one of the great things about Tolstoy is his ability to populate a huge canvas with his own sympathies. I've forgotten the Russian, uh, there's a particular Russian critic who said even the horse rubbing its innocent behind on a tree gets its, as it were, place in Tolstoy's consciousness. He enters the consciousness of the, of the horse. But I think the desire to impose order on the world is particularly the case of the producer as opposed to the consumer of the arts. And I think the, the desire to gather things together, it's quite a dominating desire to some extent. The, the desire to reduce the whole universe to one brushstroke is quite a sort of tyrannical desire. But I think you're absolutely right. And I would give a completely different talk or perhaps a complimentary talk when focusing on what art means for the artist, for the drama of being an artist, a really great artist, discovering new ways of gathering things. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah very beautiful. Um, you said that in the beginning of your talk that somehow these people who are great art experiences and connoisseurs aren't better people. Um, why do you think that is? If, you know, in a way, if 
some, some of why maybe we're not such good people has to do with some of our wounds and our, our lack of uh, getting it, whatever, or... Yes. Um, I, yeah. Uh, well, it, it's interesting, what makes people good? I mean, as a doctor, the vast majority, of probably the 300,000 patients I saw over my 35, 40 year career, the vast majority would probably not read a book. Many of them were very good people. A lot of people I know do read lots of books, and they're nothing like as good as a lot of the patients that I uh, were treating. I mean, one particular point in example, I did obstetrics for a year, and I used to run the antenatal ward. And for the first time ever, a lot of women were free from daily life to, because they had um, preeclamptic toxemia, they had to be in bed to lower their blood pressure and so on. So they were suddenly free to do whatever they like with their consciousness, not badgered by husbands, job, children, whatever. And I couldn't recall any of my patients in West Bromwich ever picking up a, a novel that I regard as a work of art. So there's a clearly a double dissociation between one's acquaintance with the great works of art and one's um, ethical behavior and goodness and empathy in everyday life. Yes. It's a difficult one for me because I feel a sense of defeat in saying that. Deep defeat. Oh. Th thank you for a fascinating talk, Rose. You. Opened up so many uh, what great ideas. I, I was just uh, wanted to say something about your sort of thesis of the wound, the wound in the present tense yeah. of consciousness. And it reminded me of um, Alan uh, quoting from Four Quartets. But Alan said, uh, that Elliot said, all time is unredeemable. But I think he, before that he said, if all time is eternally present, all time is unrede unredeemable, which is perhaps quite similar to what you're saying. But I was wondering, is the present tense in consciousness essentially wounded, or uh, can it be healed by other means? For example, in meditation, isn't the aim to be more and more present mm -hmm. rather than not present? Uh, is, is that a kind of unwounded present tense of yeah. consciousness? I think that's a really good question, and it just seems to me there's something about us that is incomplete and unfinished. We are partly liberated from our biological destiny, and in fact for the last five million years we've been parting company with the other primates. Our nearest primate kin, chimpanzees, they're five million years behind us. And it seems to be that, uh, so we have a lot of biological business to transact, a lot of our agenda and the way we are connected from moment to moment is clearly related to the needs of the organism. But these have become enormously transformed by um, the community of minds which we've built up over the last five million years. But it seems to me that we are in a state, we are transitional creatures. I mean, for those who have religious belief, that's easy. We were, we were separately created in the image of God. And if we are divided, it's because we have a divine aspect and a less divine aspect, biological aspect. But for those of us humanists, I think it, there is something about us in which we're an incomplete and in transitional state. And that is reflected in the way that our consciousness seems to unravel and unfold in ways that are sometimes at odds with an idea we might have of perfected experience. That's a, not a very good answer to your very good question. But uh, thank you, it is a good answer. <laughs> I just wanted, you, you've talked about the wound of the present tense, but you haven't talked about the wound of the past tense. Mm -hmm. And could one say that photography attempts to deal with that wound, that the, the, the sadness of the, of the loss of the present? Did you say photography? Yes. Yes, yes. It seems to be part of the wound of the present tense is the future tense and the past tense. They, they actually open up the wound. Um, although also they give the present an incredible richness and depth. I and mean, there's no such thing as the present moment in a mathematical sense anyway. I mean, we don't have this extensionless point we move from moment to moment. But whether photography... I mean, now is a good time to ask that question because people have more photographs than they have time to look at. So they will have a thousand, a hundred thousand photographs of places they went to which they didn't experience because they were too busy photographing them. I'm thinking of weddings that are nowadays given over entirely to the cameraman, that are their own external surface, that are entirely choreographed. Uh, and in many ways, photography reminds you that you really weren't there, you had your eye behind the camera. So I don't know whether photography 
really does deal with that sense of loss of the past. My God, I wouldn't be without some photographic mementos, uh, but it's so easy to move from memories to mementos, uh, or to mementos that are stored in a drawer one day will be looked at. If, if it's uh, permitted to have a second yes, please. Uh, um, <laughs> comment, at least. I, what um, Celia has just raised it is very important for a certain kind of art. If you think of what Proust was trying to do in, in, in Un Recherche du Temps Perdu, I mean, it is entirely about bringing into the present something which is imbued with a sense of loss hmm. and thereby redeeming it. You know, that, that because it can be, as it were, represented, purged of perhaps of its painful elements and put into a kind of order uh, that, it, that we are, it, it, it no longer hurts. And that is an aspect that perhaps um, amplifies your point, and that art can, uh, can bring completion to something which is essentially incomplete, but it does it by looking back across time. I think that's true, and I mean, the, the, obviously the whole driver, as we all know, for A La Recherche de Tom Perdue was certain moments of involuntary memory, when you actually re-inhabited the world of those moments, often through something trivial, the bumpiness of a pavement in Venice or a, a Madeleine, so, Madeleine soaked in coffee, and that gives you the sense that perhaps after all, yes, it is lost, but it is retrievable. So there's two things going on in Proust. One is the hope that comes from involuntary memory, that utterly blissful feeling of being extended in time and the past really hasn't gone. And the other is the urgency, as it were, to recover all that was round, what was revealed by involuntary memory. Yeah. And redemption is such a broad term, isn't it? One, it means buying back in a very simple sense. But the other is much more profound, like the religious notion of redemption. And it just seems to me, certainly as I get older, the sense of poignancy and loss of the unrevisitable things, whether it's one's own childhood, a forgotten boredom, or other people, or one's children's childhood, which is vivid, those things that you do have a sense of loss and the desire to redeem them, to get, to get them back, to buy them back in some sense. And that seems to me to be very important for the producer of art in particular, more so perhaps than the consumer of art. Hate that or contrast but that's the only way I can put it yeah uh, yes right thank you very much for this very thank interesting uh, talk uh, maybe two remarks the first is a question uh, there is a brain scientist which we all very well know Ernst Pöppel who described uh, who worked a lot I believe maybe you could um, say something about it that our experience of presence is in a window of three seconds mm -hmm. it's a three second window because there's a lot of work that all kind of poetry has this three-second rhythm as well in musical um, patterns. You always find a three-second, this is our range of present, yes. the present moment. This is the first like, kind of question. What do yeah. you think about that? And the other one is you, you were mentioning the autobiograph autobiographical uh, uh, value of art. and. Um, I came across a very beautiful description of uh, a Macedonian peasant healer who, uh, for healing his patients who were, had psychological problems or uh, diseases, would sit them in front of a, a white wall, stand behind them for a certain time, feel what's wrong with the patient, and then jump in front of him, take a big um, uh, uh, brush, paintbrush of red color, and then paint on this white wall, what he felt was going on hmm. with the patient. And then the patient finally had the opportunity to look at his inner trouble, I'd say, with this outside visualized thing, thanks to the, uh, the healer, the peasant healer. And it came to me that basically this is what we artists most of the time try to do, is to give, or what good art does to me, is that suddenly in the outside, in in a musical piece or in a play or whatever, I feel, I can hear, I suddenly get materialized what is inside of me in this very diffuse, neb nebulous state and suddenly this is, oh, I'm not alone, there yeah. it is. And this is this, to me this is beyond maybe what you described, this very autobiographical, autobiographical, 
meaning of, of art. Maybe you could say something about that too. I mean, Thank you. Taking your points in reverse order, it seems to me you're absolutely right. One of the things is art does put outside of us something that is elusive and inside of us and arrests it to some extent. I mean, the great thing about a piece of music that moves you is you know you can listen to it again and again and again. So I think that's a really important point of putting things outside of us. It's part of the redemption, part of recovering uh, our own past and indeed the larger past of the collective to which we belong. Your other point about Hans Purple's work on the three second interval, the so-called specious present. In fact, a lot of work has been done more recently dividing up the specious present. There's different sorts of visual independence on vision, hearing, meaning, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's difficult to know how that would relate, for example, to the reading of poetry. Because when you're reading poetry, what you're acquiring is meaning. And meaning doesn't have that objective time span in the way that, um, say, visual stimuli and so on. So I, I, I'm familiar with Hans Purple's work, but I've never been persuaded that it explains to us anything about the way poetry is, 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 is chopped up. But there's certainly some very interesting work on the specious present uh, and how eventually it all gets connected up into a much broader sense of present. Because the present isn't just T1, an instant. It isn't just a minute. It's today and this year and so on. And all that is the present in the, uh, in the realm of meaning, which isn't in the same way subordinate to the um, instant fadingness of the immediate specious present. So, sorry to intrude again, but I want to take up something that Maria just said. Um, just a passing phrase. She said that uh, when this process of this therapist has uh, occurred, the experience comes to the patient of, you know, I am not alone. Yeah. Uh, that surely is one of the fundamental experiences that, the, that art delivers to us. You haven't really said anything about that. No. It's been about me and, my, and myself. But actually, certainly in Shakespeare, and this is the great thing that comes to you all the time, you know, I'm not alone. The, the, the world that I have suffered inwardly, there it is presented to me, and others too feel, you know, uh, res resonate to it, so that I'm being brought into an imagined community of the redeemed. Yeah, there's a phrase. I think that's absolutely, and, and in a sense, it appeals to us as part of the community of minds. Yeah. And the sense of when uh, Thomas Mann once talked about novels being a gesture of kindliness and humour shared across the world. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily apply to, to an awful lot in his own novels, but there's this that sense of a higher solidarity. Uh, and I, I would totally share that. That it, I've talked about I, but it really is about we art, and or at least. The I experience of art would be a pretty barren thing, be like drugs almost, if it didn't actually connect with a bigger we. No, I would agree with that, yeah. Ray, I really loved your talk, um, Jeffrey here. As, as a performer, I would like to just say that I think the wound in the present is particularly in the present continuous. Uh, Hebrew, um, French, and German do not have present continuous like English. We cannot say in those languages, I am playing. And this seems to me where the wound is because the difficulty of paying attention as so many things are happening, anticipating what is coming next, this seems to be where the wound truly lies. Uh, as a performing artist, I, I, I have to deal with this all the time. I just wanted to add that little note. And, and I certainly recognize very much what you're saying about that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think that within the digital age that we are living in, it's actually possible to distinguish between the individual wound and the collective wound? I think not, and I would very much agree with what Roger said in many ways, that we are th through and through social beings. You know, I'm reviewing a book at the moment on thinking, and in particular hearing voices. And the voices one hears in one's head are voices that are taken from the collective to some extent. The very process of making ourselves intelligible ourselves 
is done through language, which belongs to all of us. So I think your, uh, your point is, is very much taken.